So I wanted to welcome you all to Reality Check. This is Mahatma Das. I'm here with Akura. Today we're going to be talking about one of Akura's passions, which is coaching. And first thing I wanted to ask you, what is coaching and how do you, how do you distinguish it between consulting, teaching, mentoring, counseling, and therapy? Coaching is more about <clears throat> facilitating your learning and drawing forth from you knowledge, realizations, understandings, goals, solutions, while uh, teaching is putting in information, yeah. giving people information about different things. Uh, therapy deals with emotional scars and the past. Counseling deals with similar things, just milder. Uh, consulting is giving solutions, giving advice. Uh, but coaching helps you find your own solutions. You become more self-reliant. So one of my understandings of coaching that distinguishes it from therapy, it seems at least to me that a person who wants coaching has definite goals they want to achieve. And often, but not always in therapy, people have specific issues they're dealing with. And, and they're not goals of achieving something we would say in terms of so-called success or tangibles as opposed to resolving an internal problem. Mm -hmm. You know, I have this I have this issue from the past that is affecting me today and I need to deal with it. Would that be a correct assumption yeah. of the differences? Yeah. Then my next question would be Vaishnava philosophy we know teaches and we know by experience teaches that, uh, from our own experience, that we were in ignorance, or it teaches that we are in ignorance, we need a guru to show us the path. And now, now you're saying, kind of like, well, coaching uh, allows you to become your own guru, so wouldn't that just create even a greater problem? Or are you saying that once you have a guru, or you have knowledge, at that point, then coaching facilitates the application of that knowledge? The specific coaching I do is Gita coaching, which is spiritual coaching, and basically I help people follow the instructions of Prabhupada or their, their current guru, and uh, so it's all based around our philosophy. Uh, it's not that you become your own guru, but you become more take more responsibility and learn and find out ways how to effectively apply the knowledge that is already there in the scriptures. So it, it's, it's bridging the gap between the head, what you've got in your head, yeah. and perhaps even what has gone to your heart that you want, but practically achieving it step by step through implementation, but empowering the person you're coaching to come up with their own decisions on how to do that, or helping them see ways that they can do that. Yeah. I don't empower them, they empower themselves, or Krishna empowers them. You facilitate them. Yeah. I, 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 I try to create an environment where they can think more effectively and uh, clarify what they want. It's very important. <clears throat> Until they know what they want, then they're more or less stuck. But when they clarify what they want, then you know we can work on creating goals and achieving goals. So are you saying that sometimes when you coach someone, because I, I was assuming that when you coach someone or a person wants a coach because they already know what they want. So are you saying that sometimes a person wants a coach because they don't know what they want and they want to become clear? So both things are there? Well, yeah. Uh, it's a, In one sense, it's easier to work with people who know what they want. But if people don't know what they want, or it's vague, they, they want something too general, then coaching helps become more specific. Now what about people maybe listening to this, I mean devotees may be listening to this and think, well it's not about what I want, it's about what my guru wants. So well, how do you deal with that in a coaching situation? Or is that, is that, is that a problem for someone? Very few people can just follow what Guru t tells them. So usually, guru, nowadays I have seen many Gurus, they ask devotees, what do you want to do for Krishna? Uh, and, and then they say, well, I want to make money and give half to the temple or to printing Prabhupada's books or something similar. 
And then he says, well, then do this, you know, and report to me or something, he encourages them to do that. So very few people can just do the needful. And also Prabhupada, Srila Prabhupada has, uh, in a few letters, he mentioned that actually it's advantageous, it's favorable to do something you are inspired about, what you like to do. And uh, then even, he said, it will be easier to follow the principles. So you're facilitating, for, the, for this person who's not clear about what they want to do, you might have to facilitate helping them find, within the parameters of the instructions of Guru and Shastra, what enthuses them, what inspires them yeah. to serve Krishna, and then clarify a vision of what they would like to achieve, let's say, with, with, within this year or six months or within five years or all of that. And then you would start to, to help them discover ways in which they can do that. Yes. Now... Do you ever run into to situations in which that's all done, but the person has a major fear or obstacle or blockage in doing that? And if so, how do you help them? <clears throat> Depends how this blockage is uh, severe. Sometimes these blockages come from some uh, traumas from the past and you know emotional. Uh, scars or abuse uh, so I this is not my area I don't deal with that I send them to other professionals or yeah other devotees or other professionals uh, so but if blockages are uh, um, I would say less severe and they have to do with their misconceptions then we can work on removing fear and usually the main obstacle to do anything is fear, some kind of fear, either fear of success or fear of failure. Well, how would you, for people who are listening to this, who might be thinking, okay, it would be, I think having a coach would be good, but they might also be thinking, but I'm not sure, maybe I need a therapist, maybe my issue is, is, is too deep or troubling, troublesome. So how, how can they distinguish themselves what they need? That's a very, very important question. Well, usually, through my experience, I, I, I'm able to see that whether I can help them as a coach or not. And, you know, people show certain symptoms that when they're emotionally disturbed and something is... they become extremely mental or they become extremely thoughtful about something when they speak about something and you can see or feel it's very, very deep. There was maybe some abuse in the past and uh, or they cannot forgive someone and it's very deep so then, then in other I, words you can't move forward because that problem keeps coming up and yes. you can't get past it like a major obstacle and then you realize that this person needs to needs other kinds of professional help to resolve this and once they resolve that particular issue they can go forward whereas it seems like the other thing you're talking about is is that it's it's common even for successful people to have some fear yeah. of of doing something they haven't done, taking on a new occupation or a new service, a new project, mm. and it is also interesting because I don't I don't know if people consciously think about the fear of being successful, mm. but I know as devotees because we we come to Krishna consciousness most of us, with a strong desire to be appreciated, our conditioned side. We want to be appreciated, we want to be recognized, that's, that's what we bring in when we, when we come to devotional service, unless we're, we're, we've practiced Krishna consciousness very deeply in the past or many, or many lifetimes. And then when we come to Krishna consciousness, we learn, well, it's supposed to be the exact opposite. Rather than wanting recognition, we should offer that to others. And there may be a fear then if I become successful, along with that success will come recognition, honor, followers, wealth, so many things. And on one side, because we're attached to it, the other, on the other side we may be afraid of it, that I don't, I'm afraid to have it because I am attached to it and I might misuse it. So how would you help someone, because that seems to be a common, for us as devotees could be a common problem, how would you help someone with that? They have to understand our philosophy. You know, they have to understand that uh, the credit goes to Krishna for our achievements. 
uh, we shouldn't be proud of the borrowed plums and uh, uh, that you you there is no limit to how much you can achieve if you don't care who takes the credit so we know that Krishna has given us intelligence, uh, physical strength, uh, mental power, and that it's thanks to him that we can achieve anything. So it's his credit. And uh, it's better to do something and become proud than sit and lament and do nothing. You know, and just sink in the mode of ignorance. Srila Bhakti Siddhanta, I heard that he said that he wanted his disciples to get into the mode of passion. And you know, so-called goodness, I call this tamo goodness. <laughs> you know that we we think we are in the mode of goodness, but we are actually in the mode of ignorance. We are afraid to do anything, so the fear of failure, fear of mistakes, sometimes fear of success. And Bhagavad Gita says you should be you should be equal in fame and infamy. So if we don't experience this in our lives, how we can practice this? I also remember. When Prabhupada first asked us, his disciples, to go to India, he called us his dancing white elephants. And he wanted to show us off. And he said, <laughs> he said, your behavior will glorify me because you're my disciples. And, and when people see that you're sadhus, they will ask, who's your guru? Your guru must be wonderful because you're wonderful. Just like when you see children who are well-behaved, intelligent, so forth, do you naturally think, oh, they must have very good parents. Yeah. So I think, I think that's very helpful that we want to glorify Krishna and Srila Prabhupada and our spiritual master. Yeah. And if we become successful, yeah. that will glorify them. And as Prabhupada showed, he always gave the glory, always gave the credit to his spiritual master. So, you know, this, it's, it's a little bit of a, you know, like I say, because the anartha of wanting to be recognized is there. We have to transfer that to wanting Krishna to be recognized. And Prabhupada, even in a letter um, to me, he wrote the same thing. He said, don't try to become famous, try to make Krishna famous. Yeah. No. So, then I think, well, I have to become, if I become famous, that can make Krishna famous. But my motive is not to become famous. My mm -hmm. motive is to introduce people to Krishna. Mm -hmm. So what are some, um, if you could describe some perhaps typical situations or, or common situations when people come to you for coaching and how you help them get past or get, I don't want to say past obstacles, but for lack of a better word, get beyond where they are now. Because obviously coaching is meant to take someone further and, and, and they need a coach because they're not getting there on their own. If they're getting there on their own, why they wouldn't want a coach. They wouldn't feel a need for it. So let's say you're you're coaching me and I'm doing something, but I want to do more and I'm, I've kind of been stuck. I can't get beyond this point. What are, what are some of the things that you would ask me? Or how would you deal with me? Just so people listening could understand if, if coaching is, is beneficial, would be beneficial for them. People come to me because they either have a problem to solve or a result to achieve. And uh, so we look into... First, the first thing that I usually do is increase awareness. By asking questions, I help them become more aware of what's going on, what they're thinking, what they're feeling, what they want, what other people are doing, what is the situation. I also try to help them to be more objective rather than just subjective. Just try to see things a bit from the side, from a side, try to be a bit neutral or objective. Uh, and uh, so once they become more aware of what's going on and what they want, then uh, we can take more concrete steps. And so what would you like to do next? Uh, you you know, say become more aware. Yeah. You're talking about giving them more objectivity? about their situation or, or, and or aware of options that they didn't see before and aware, more aware of what else? What else they become aware First, of? First, uh, see where they are now. What is the situation? For example, someone can say, well, I have so many problems in my life. Okay, so what problems do we have? Then they 
name 10 problems and I said, so which one would you like to work on now? Which one is most pressing or most important? Or which one just, which one do you choose to work on now? And so we take one thing and then work on that. But we're, but working on one thing, we actually cover so many things and we also get into other things. And then, then we totally look into Why? that. Why? Because the mentality or the activity that created one problem usually is the same for mentality example, that's creating yeah, other problems. For example, like a habit, like bad habit influenced all of these problems. One bad habit, for example, like, you know, not getting up early, not chanting your rounds. This influences everything. Uh, influences your consciousness and uh, everything you do. So, uh, so we look into into one thing. We do one thing at a time. We don't do ten things at once, and do do it very thoroughly. And then this this gives so much insight. They become more aware. They discover things. They say, "Oh my God! Oh, I didn't realize I had this, or I have this uh, this thing with, within me that is holding me back." Or I have this talent. We also work on, on positive, uh, discovering positive things, talents, skills, strengths. And, and as you mentioned, also discovering more options. They become aware that actually there is many more options that I see at, at the moment. And they become more hopeful and inspired to work on their goals. So you just mentioned about discovering their talents or, or maybe getting more in touch Maximizing, maximizing on their talents. Yes. I know that some people think or could think that coaching is actually really suited for people who are not successful, who are, who are, for lack of a better word, which we call in America, maybe around the world they use this word, losers. You know, uh -huh. This person's never really, you know, so and so, never really done much. They're a very simple person. And they need a coach, someone to push them, someone to help them see how to be successful. Whereas a person who is successful may think, I don't really need a coach because I'm, I've been successful ever since I was a, a teenager. I was the president of my class. I, I achieved this. I started a business when I was 22, etc., etc. So how do you address that Doubt. I mean, does a person who's successful, are they going to benefit from coaching or is it just for people who have trouble being successful? This is a great misconception. And one of my mentor coaches, Marshall Goldsmith, who is a behavioral coach, he coaches only successful people, only great achievers, you know, super sharp, uh, like uh, intelligent, educated, uh, capable. So coaching is for, for everyone. And like in sports, so why would the why would these super successful people? He's coaching CEOs of some of the biggest companies in the world. Is that yeah, correct? Yes. So, so why would these guys are like the most successful people out there? Why are they needing coaches? Well, he coaches people on behavior. So sometimes they have a blind spot in their behavior, so he helps them improve that. Uh, but in a, in a sports situation. Uh, top performers, they also have coaches, they have top coaches. Whether you're a poor performer or a top performer, you need a coach in order to be able to achieve more, you know, better results, higher results. So you're saying, you're saying that coaching can help everybody achieve something more. Even if you're really successful, maybe you're not going to go 100 miles with coaching like a person who has not been as successful, but you'll... You'll, you'll go further. You'll go somewhere you could not go on your own. And so, so more quickly and more efficiently than you would go on your own. If That's you'd right. even get there on your own. Yeah. yeah. So then, just putting this all in perspective, it would seem to me that if a person is not, if a person says, I don't need a coach, we could translate that and in, in say, well, I don't really need help or want help in going forward or I, or I feel I don't need to go forward. Sorry for that noise, the electricity just came on. And the printer's coming on. <laughs> so, maybe a kind of person who is, I don't want to say proud, it could be due to ignorance, it could be due to pride, and, or it could be due to just, I, I would think some people 
say, I don't need a coach because they're satisfied with where they're at and they don't want to, they don't want to see other possibilities or options or go further. And so they say, well, I don't need a coach because I'm happy where I'm at. And, and, and if, if that were the case, would you try to encourage those people or would you just say it's better that I don't encourage them because coaching wouldn't work well for them because they don't really want it? Well, everybody wants something that they don't have. Even devotees, they don't have pure love of God. So, if you want something you don't have, then you need some assistance to achieve it. Or if you already have all the tools and you, are become, you have become like a super self-coach, then, you know, in that case, you're already working hard on yourself. But sometimes this fresh, objective, outside perspective helps. Because we can't see what other people can see. And uh, they can give us ideas, they can give us feedback, they can give us feed forward. So it's always good to do this, it's always advantageous. I call it peer coach, not just I call it, but it's called peer coaching. People who are equal, they can help each other. Uh, occasionally they can discuss. It's always good. It's always advantageous. Because we are not God, we don't know everything, you know. So if you want to achieve anything, it's good to to speak about it with somebody. So, do coaches have coaches? Yes. Yeah, coach has a coach. Or they have mentor coaches, or they have friends with who, who act like coaches in their lives. And uh, So it seems like the point you're saying is, it's really the objectivity that someone else brings into your subjective world. Yeah. And even if that coach is not fantastic, even if the coach just becomes your spouse or a friend, mm -hmm. uh, asking you a few questions or even even in a consultant format, just they're bringing in points of view you may not be able to see. Or I ask you good questions. Yeah. One, one way to do peer coaching is that I give you a set of questions that I want you to ask me every day. Uh, and these questions cover the most important uh, aspects and activities of my life. And then you ask me, and you can ask me some sub-questions and... Uh, some people do it daily, some people do it weekly. So, for example, you ask me, how is your chanting? That's uh, very important to me. And then I say, oh, I haven't thought about it. I was just chanting mechanically for the past week. So, re I was honestly, my chanting is not where I want it to be. And immediately my awareness in increases and the likelihood of improving my chanting also increases because you asked me that question. And you were the one who won who told me to ask you that I question. I gave you that question. So I want to... that's important to you, so you want yes. to be reminded. Otherwise, yeah, you remind. may not remind yourself. Reminded, discuss about it, become more aware, and ultimately take action to improve it. Very good. So what's that called? Peer coaching? Peer coaching, when equals help each other, or... They don't have to be equals, but they can have... Exchange a set of questions, and then just so ask. I, but with a genuine interest. Yeah, so... If we were going to do peer coaching, I would come up with a set of questions, such as, um, I want to work on a particular project, so you would ask me, so one question I would give you is, say, did you work on this project, or how much time did you put into this project this week? Yes. I want to chant on a certain level, say on a scale of 1 to 10, I want to chant my rounds at a level 6. Uh -huh. So then I would ask you, did you chant your rounds at a level 6 or better? Mm-hmm. I wanted I want to go to bed before nine o'clock. Did you go to bed before nine? Mm -hmm. So then, each week you ask me these questions, and then you just said something, which is really important because if two people are going to do this, you just said, well, all the all the person is doing is just reading the questions that you've given that they've given you, but you have to show concern because mm -hmm. the concern is what helps the other person be self-reflective and it helps them talk and open up and if you're not concerned if you just read the questions did you change your rounds? <laughs> did, did you work on this project? like you're totally bored and uninterested and you're just doing it because of, because I asked you the but genuine interest uh, motivates people that someone is interested in what I do and it's inspiring and uh, yesterday we had this uh, Gita coaching uh, training and uh, I gave the Buddhist question uh, to ask each other, how can I help you succeed? Uh, so also, this is a very powerful question. 
you can have you can have someone ask you that question every day or whenever you meet what else could you help you could help you succeed what else could help you succeed and what what other options do you have so this these these are questions that expand your thinking you start thinking outside the box you broaden your horizons and you know you get more ideas how you can achieve what you want to achieve so what you're saying is that when you have a coach the coach is in a sense at least at that point when he's coaching you exclusively interested in your success perhaps even more interested in your success than you are <laughs> maybe yeah because because sometimes I mean we see that we want things yeah but we don't really work for them because I guess we don't want them that much or maybe we do want them but we're lazy but lazy or fearful something. or whatever whatever yeah. it is or we're just overworked or burned out or but then you have another person who wants it equally as much or even more who's not encumbered by the obstacles that are preventing you from being as focused on it as apparently you want to be so it's a very interesting dynamic that you have someone in your life who wants something as much or even more than you want it and who and who may be even more committed to you achieving it than and you are you are and um, it, it seems that that's also the position of the spiritual master that he he's giving you krishna consciousness and he is your He's your coach. He's rooting for you. He's praying for you. Yeah. And he wants you to have it even maybe perhaps more than you even want it. Yeah. Well, that's really, really, uh, I would say, a, uh, giving life, inspiring to have someone like this. And it's in line. I think all preachers and teachers and brahmanas and uh, all the devotees who assist others in ISKCON they should have this goal, Sarve Sukhino Bhavantu. Prabhupada gave this for leaders as basically one of the instructions that you should make everyone happy, everyone that you are leading. So basically coaching helps you uh, become happy in all areas of your life or successful in all areas of your life. And, uh, and then you know that then there is nothing lacking in your life. You are happy and then you can also help others. For me, the success of my coaching is if my coaches, my coaches become preachers, leaders, coaches, or responsible parents, like that. You know, some, some responsibility, you know. Because when you accept responsibility, this means you are following your dharma and you are, you know, connected to God. But do you find that when you coach someone, it naturally helps them become more responsible because you're not telling them what to do, but you're asking them to find answers, options, to deal with whatever it is they want to achieve. And so when you're finished with the coaching, they're in a different mindset because they've discovered so much on their own already. Exactly. Yeah. One of the main goals of coaching is to help people take 108% responsibility for their lives. And... Uh, once I have seen in working with over 300 devotees over the past five six years that those who take responsibility they start moving forward towards success, but those who don't they remain stuck. So you're, so are you saying that some people become dependent on a coach and they can't without them? I mean, when 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 the coaching should be finished or staggered over longer periods of time they're just not taking responsibility and therefore they don't really achieve as much as they could or, or is it kind of like an artificial dependency like they need that person always there because they're weak and then that's not well, these healthy are, I think we are talking about two different things uh, one is uh, becoming uh, self-sufficient and independent uh, of, the co of the coach that's one thing. Another thing is taking responsibility for some or all the aspects of your life. Uh, so, if someone is remaining in a coaching relationship, it doesn't mean they, they don't take responsibility in their lives. And maybe they still need help. So, it, it, can, it can last, I don't know, 
three months, six months, a year. I coach people for years, but then I coach them every one or two months whenever they need assistance. But some people I coach one twice and they are ready to go. They, they just go, they know what needs to be done, they clarify certain things. And then occasionally I ask them, how are you doing? And then they say, I'm doing well. Or, so either they are really doing well or they are afraid because they know if they come back to me, we will be confronting all the obstacles and <clears throat> we will, I will be asking them, what do you want? And they don't want to hear that. That's a good point because someone's listening, listening to this and thinking, well, maybe coaching will be good for me. They might be thinking exactly what you just said. I don't know if I, I know what the obstacles are, both externally and internally, and I don't know if I'm really ready yeah. to deal with them. Yeah. So... Do you would you say that even if they think that way, the coaching will empower them or facilitate them or enable them in some way if they to, continue, to deal with that? To yeah, deal with those yeah. Doubts? If they continue, they they continue uh, with with the coaching relationship. Then you know, it will become obvious that they have to make their own choices. They have to take responsibility. They have to work on removing obstacles, and just you know, it's very simple. Just go forward. Be happy. So, so is, your, is your experience that there's actually more pain and not dealing with it? Yes, exactly. Even if there's this big fear, oh, I can't deal with this, that's more painful not to and just avoid it? It eats you up. It just eats you up. You see, I think Krishna wants us to be conscious. Uh, and <laughs> so Very rarely things happen automatically. You have to be either very lucky or very pure so that just by, you know, doing things. Uh, but Krishna wants us to be aware. We, why do we have consciousness? To be conscious. And especially to be Krishna conscious, but we have consciousness to be conscious of how to proceed, how to advance, how to remove obstacles, how to recognize the strengths, and how to, you know, appreciate what God has given us. What, what I've noticed in all the workshops I've done is if you just give people time to reflect on whatever it is that we're teaching at that moment. Just give them time to reflect on it. Where do they stand with it? It could be japa, it could be forgiveness, it could be vows, it could be prayer. I've done workshops on all of these. And just give them time to reflect. Where do you stand on this? Where would you like to go? What are the obstacles? Where are your strengths? Where are your weaknesses? It helps them so much because we don't do that enough. We're busy. You know, we just don't think about these things enough. And then, as you say, they kind of gnaw at us. They, they remain there. And also, within, with, with having another person, as you said, we come up with options. We, we, we deal with this a lot and when we talk about forgiveness. When people say, I can't forgive. And, and there may be many reasons to that, but one of the reasons is you just don't know how. You, 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 you only think... The only my only response to what happened to me is to be angry. Yeah, you don't understand. There can be other responses. There there can be other ways to deal with it. And then by having another person say, "Oh, I never thought I could, I could actually deal with it this way. I never thought that I could be involved in taking this person to court, but at the same time forgiving them for what they've done. Oh, oh, so I can do yes. that. Yeah. Yeah. So you see another option. Yeah. So with a coach, options increase. Choices increase. That's very there's, important. Yeah, there is two. These two, I want to go back to basics. Two basic principles of coaching are awareness and choice. And I would say responsibility. These three things. That you have more choices than your... You become aware that you have more choices? Yeah, and you are responsible for your choices. And also, one thing, that you choose what you want. People tell me, I don't know what you want, and I tell them, well, you can choose what you want. If I, if I give you, like, a bag of apples and, and bag of uh, mangoes, uh, you will choose what you want. You will say, well, I don't know... I, I will like both of them, I don't know what you want, but ultimately you will choose. If you have to choose one of them, you will choose what, whether you want a bag of apples or a bag of mangoes. So it's our responsibility to choose responsibly, to choose according to what we, to the best of our ability, according to what we know is right, right choice. So when you're talking about choice, are you, you're confronting people who think they don't have a choice? Is that your point? 
I'm, okay. not, I'm just telling them you have a choice. So, in other words, they're in a situation where they don't think there is a choice. It's just, this is the way it is. I'm doing what I'm doing. My life is the way it is. My spiritual life is the way it is. It's my karma. It's set. Yeah. It can't be any different. Different, You know, it's pre predestined, preordained. It's not true. It, it, there is a destiny, but uh, you you can you can affect your life. You are the most creative force in your life, along with Krishna. You know, Krishna. Can you remember what I was told? The Prabhupada said, fifty percent of your karma, fifty percent of what you're doing, the karma you're creating, you get it in this life, not the next life. This is we're 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 sometimes thinking, well, whatever's happening in this life is totally. Because of what happened in the last life, yeah, I'm kind of a pawn yeah. in the game. Yeah. And he's saying no. Fifty percent has been created in this life. Yeah. Which helps us with this, with with the, with those who might think things are totally written in stone, and I have very there's very little I can do about it. But. Yeah. But this is again we go one one big area I'm dealing with in coaching is excuses. So our philosophy you can use for so many excuses, you know, this is my karma, this is Krishna, you just blame it on somebody else, and you are not taking responsibility. That's a tough thing. Many people just have, they are very sophisticated in how they make excuses, but I don't buy into it. Very um, deep, philosophically <laughs> articulated, mm -hmm. profound excuses. Yeah. So I have, is that common with people uh, that when you begin talking, is it common that most people will will give you the reasons that they cannot move forward, or is or is that just a certain? I mean, amongst devotees, is that a common, or is it just is it an individual case? Well, most people tend to give reasons or excuses, and uh, I just ask them, you know, what do, what do you want to have in your life? Excuses or results, and then they say results. So then you have to give up this habit of trying to convince me why you cannot do something. And the, and the excuses sometimes are valid, but it doesn't help you move forward. So you have to see. Yeah. No, this is my situation. I have two children, have this job. I work eight nine hours a day. Okay, so I, my time is limited. So so you would probably say something like, okay, well, how much time do you have? How much time can you make? What can you do within those? two hours.